Hello and welcome to episode 13 of Cold Case Christmas. In this episode, we're travelling halfway around the world for me, from where I am in the UK, to Martha Vale, which is a suburb just south of Adelaide in South Australia. And this case is about 12-year-old Rihanna Barrow, who disappeared from her home in Wakefield Avenue, Martha Vale on October 7th, 1992. Media described it as an ominous prophecy, which remains true today, when homicide detective Alan Arthur spoke these words in October 92. He was calling for information from the public to find missing Rihanna. And he said, without their assistance, this case will flounder and it may well become another Beaumont mystery Adelaide Oval abduction mystery that we may never solve. And to this day, this case remains unsolved. What happened to 12 year old Rihanna Barrow? Let's get into her story. So Rihanna lived with her mother Paula and brother Shannon. Rihanna's parents were no longer together, but she remained close to both of them. Rihanna's dad, Leon, was living on the Gold Coast, Queensland at the time with his wife, his new wife, Sandra. It was the summer school holidays and while Rihanna usually spent her break with her dad up north, this time she'd chosen to stay home with her mum. Her brother, Shannon, was away at the time of Rihanna's disappearance on school camp. It was about 8.30am when a mother parlour was about to leave the family home to go to work. Rihanna was actually planning to catch the bus to meet her mother at the local shopping centre, which was approximately six kilometres away from her home, to buy some Christmas cards. And she wanted a specific special card for her American pen pal. Paula had heard on the radio that there was going to be a bus strike that day and there was a change of plan. Before Paula left for work, she went into Rihanna's room. Rihanna was listening to music as she usually did. And she said because there was a bus strike that day, maybe she could walk to the nearer Reynalda shopping centre instead to buy her Christmas cards. This shopping centre was only 1.5 kilometres so about a 20 minute walk away from their home. And Rihanna was only 12, but she was a responsible girl. So it seemed like a good solution. Paula gave Rihanna a final kiss goodbye. And this was a very final goodbye. The police spent a considerable amount of time trying to retrace Rihanna's steps, just to see if that would give them any clues whatsoever about what happened. And it's believed that Rihanna stayed at home until about 10.30 when she was seen walking in the direction of the shops as agreed with her mother. Sources claim that Rihanna bought the card for her pen pal from newsagents at 11.19 a.m. Rihanna was then seen again at 12.05 p.m. and then at 12.30 p.m walking through the grounds of Moffat Vale High School, carrying a bag that was thought to contain the card. And this was the last sighting of Rihanna that the police could find. There's some speculation that there was another sighting of her at 4 p.m. standing alone at a junction of David Terrace and Acre Avenue, but that's unconfirmed by law enforcement. But at approximately 4.10 p.m., Paula returned to the family home to find the door locked. When she entered the house, she was met with a record lying on the floor and the TV still on. So you would think that Rihanna was still in. On the dining room table, the card that Rihanna had bought for her pen pal was there in its plastic wrapper. So it's clear that Rihanna had gone home. So the sighting of her at 11.19 in the news agents and then heading towards home at 12.30, walking through the grounds of the high school made complete sense that she'd gone home. All of Rihanna's personal belongings were still in the house. No sign of forced entry, no sign that there'd been a scuffle, no sign of anything untoward. 
there was just no sign of Rihanna. Like she'd just left. Maybe she'd left in a hurry and left the TV on. Paula did a full search inside and outside. She went to her neighbours' houses, but they said they hadn't seen Rihanna. I guess some of those neighbours would have been at work throughout the day. Paula had hoped that maybe Rihanna had gone to a friend's house and she just not told her mother where she was going. But that was unlikely because Rihanna would normally tell her mother if she was going to be away. She'd not told her mother of any plans that she was going to see her friends. The only thing that they'd talked about was her going to buy some Christmas cards. So at around 6pm, Paula contacted the police. Two days later, Detective Alan Arthur was called in to lead the investigation. And Alan Arthur said, at the time I went through the preliminary statements gathered by the two detectives from Major Crime and I read all the additional information that had been gathered, I knew something was wrong. I knew she was in trouble. At the time we established she'd been seen at the shopping centre and she was seen walking through the Moffat Vale school grounds. We can only assume she was on her way home with the cards from the shop. After that, there is very, very little. There were public appeals, and a week after the disappearance, Rihanna's dad appealed to the public in a press conference. Let's play that clip now. In the week since Rihanna Burrow's disappearance, police have received more than 300 calls, 28 of them since 6 p.m. yesterday. The major crime squad admits they're no closer to finding the abductor, although several calls overnight were described as very interesting and have helped open up the inquiry a little further. Rihanna's father, Leon Burrow, issued a media appeal today. We've got a major concern uh, for the safety of not only Rihanna, um, who we've... Uh, except it may not come home, um, but the safety of other 12-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old schoolgirls that are out there that have to travel to and from school every day and also need to ensure that they and whose parents also need to ensure that they're going to be safe in the future. The, the possibility if, uh, if he's successful and uh, remains uh, undetected, the chances are uh, he might uh, take a liking to doing it and uh, strike again. There's no doubt about that's a possibility. Rihanna's father, Leon Barrow, flew from his home in Queensland to help with that search. And he said, I would really like to have a policeman knock at our door tomorrow morning and say, here's your little girl back in one piece. But the reality of that, I think, as everyone knows, is fairly insignificant. And Paula Barrow spoke to the abductor and said, please come forward. I just want my daughter back. It's not the same at home. The family said, it's like life's worst nightmare, like waking up in the morning and walking past Rihanna's bedroom door and bursting into tears. It's standing in the shower and howling. It's walking into the kitchen and opening the kitchen cupboard and seeing Rihanna's favorite cereal in there, in the cupboard and bursting into tears. It's smelling her presence in the house and bursting into tears. It's just a continuous flow of emotional highs and lows. The police initially were flooded with tip-offs. Detective Mr. Arthur said, there were a couple of reported sightings in Acre Avenue and we spent a lot of time establishing whether they were legitimate and accurate. And we came to the conclusion that most likely they weren't associated with Rihanna Barrow. So that sighting at 4 p.m. possibly wasn't her, but it did lead to a theory that the police worked with that she was somewhere close by. And Mr. Arthur said, I would have thought if she was walking down a street, Wakefield Avenue into Acre Avenue, someone would have seen her positively or seen someone at least in a motor vehicle approach her or at least see something that is suspicious and might give us a call. But they searched everywhere, rubbish dumps, bushland. By the time they scaled down the search, it had been intensive. There were some false leads and hoaxes. One tip-off claimed Rihanna was being held hostage in apartments on Anzac Highway. Police raided the building, but there was no sign of her. Police thought they had a breakthrough and went public with the sighting of a suspicious white Tirana with a Victoria number plate. But the sighting of this Tirana led police nowhere. Mr. Arthur said, I have some doubts whether it was a white Tirana and with Victoria number plates. 
because we haven't found it and we spent a lot of time looking at white Tiranas. So was it a different car? Was there a reason why this white Tirana wasn't found? Was it destroyed? We can only speculate. But this gave them an interstate link and the timing of Rihanna's disappearance led to a speculation that she'd been a victim of the notorious Victorian predator who was nicknamed Mr. Cruel. He brazenly abducted and sexually assaulted at least three young girls between 1987 and 1991. 10-year-old Sharon Wills and 13-year-old Nicola Linas were both abducted from their homes in Melbourne and held at secret locations where they were molested, but they were later released, but not 13-year-old Carmaine Chan, who was abducted from home in front of her siblings in 1991 and was found murdered months later. A connection between the cases was never made, it was just a theory. And Mr. Cruel was never located either. So whether Rihanna's abductor had abducted other girls previously and has abducted other girls since, we may never know. Mr. Arthur told reporters at the time, we don't know what we've got on our plate. I can't guarantee that this was a one-off situation. A few weeks later, though, an unusual development occurred, and this was reported in the local newspaper. A man found a set of keys in Highway Drive just a few hundred metres from Rihanna's home, matching a description of the keys that Rihanna was thought to have on her, so her door keys. He called the police from a payphone across the road and said when he returned to the location, the keys were gone. On the afternoon she went missing, this man said he had seen a girl matching Rihanna's description near a white Tirana in the same location. It was another strange lead that led nowhere. So detectives and Rihanna's family had to reach the inevitable that she may not come home. Mr. Arthur said, I was hesitant to say to her mother that I think she's been abducted, kidnapped and taken. But within a couple of weeks, I had to be blunt and say, I think she's gone. Currently, the South Australian police operation Persist investigates cold cases and is in charge of the disappearance and suspected murder of Rihanna Barrow. Operation Persist has had some big breakthroughs recently with high profile arrests over cold cases. But although this case remains open, and police would urge anyone with information to come forward. Police have no significant details to add at this time. But even a small piece of information can be of great assistance and might be the thing that breaks this 40-year-old case wide open. So were you in the area of Morfat Vale, South Australia, on Wednesday 7th of October 1992? Is there something, however small, that you remember? If so, please contact Crime Stoppers, which you can do anonymously, on 1800 333 000, or at their website, crimestoppersa.com.au. What do you think happened? Do you think her murder was linked to other abductions of young children? at that time let me know in the comments below and i'll see you in the next episode of cold case christmas bye guys